Hello, everyone. This is National Master Derek Kelly. Hello, everyone. This is National Master. This is my first video for CoChess.com and Chess24.com. We're teaming up to bring you some live information on chess here. Um, as many of you know, I have a YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash K-E-B-U chess. So if you search for me, if you search for my name on YouTube or you search for Kabo Chess or Chess Openings, you're bound to find me. Chess Openings is actually my specialty as both a player and as a coach. So basically, uh, just to give you a little background, I discovered pretty early on that there must be multiple ways to become a master at chess because all the different masters that I met had different approaches. Some masters, for example, were very skilled in tactics only. They didn't play the openings very well, didn't even play end games very well, but were sharp tacticians, right? Whereas other players, maybe the end game or strategic play was their specialty. So because of this, I became aware that there must be multiple ways to become a master because each master had significant pros, significant cons. And the opening really appealed to me for lots of reasons. Basically, I have a great interest in chess strategy, but when I tried to study strategy, what I found was that studying openings was the best way for me to familiarize myself with the strategy of the game. As many of you know, opening theory is very extensive these days because we have access to databases with millions of games. We've got computer analysis and books and theory, so there's tons and tons of theory out there. So whatever you choose to study in the openings, you're bound to find just a great deal of information, right? So in this video, in this stream, what I want to discuss is kind of the, the strategic basis for openings. And if you'll bear with me for just a second or enjoy this process with me, just what I advise my private students to do is just stop everything for a moment and really just for a moment, imagine that you're opening up your very, very, very first chess set, like your very first chess set you've ever seen. You're young, you, you're excited about learning a new game and you open up the pieces, they're in little baggies, you tear them open and out drops the rules of chess, right? I think it's a very simple starting point to start to think through chess logic. So the rules of chess have just dropped out of this, out of this board and piece set, right? And what you're going to become aware of, of course, is that chess ends in checkmate. That's the way you win the game. So no matter what we're studying, strategically, tactically, opening-wise, no matter what it is you're looking at, ultimately what you're studying is how to maximize your chances of checkmating the king. So anything we talk about today about openings has to do with either maximizing our chances of checkmating the king or it has to do with minimizing the chances of the opponent checkmating our king. And if you just think abstractly about this, there tends to be only two methods with which we can do this. One is to go for an outright attack against the king early on in the game, like a quick middle game attack. So for those of you who are aware, I'm going to slow down looking at the openings, but let's just, let's just put some things on the board. The Sicilian opening, for example, let's take a very popular position. This is, in fact, one of the main lines of chess opening theory, right? Because e4 is very popular, c5 is very popular response, then the open Sicilian is most common. And you may or may not know, again, I'm just going to be very brief with this at the moment, but in these variations, the Anus is on white to attack the Black King as quickly as possible in most of the variations. In most variations of the Sicilian, open Sicilian, white is looking to... Consolidate his extra development here because the knight is already centralized. So we've got the knight centralized here on d4. And then we also have access to this f pawn, which is more mobile in this position. So the f pawn will go forward, the g pawn will go forward at some point. And in general, white will be seeking to start an attack against the king very early on in these kinds of positions. So just roughly speaking, what I share with people is that I call this the middle game technique of trying to attack the king. Let's take, for example, let's go straight for the sharpest variation, which would be the dragon variation, right? So for those of you who are familiar or not familiar, white is going to eventually try to checkmate the king very quickly in these lines. 
And I call this the middle game approach because White is not going to try to trade off material and win an end game. He's going to try right away to create an attack against the king and checkmate the king early. So this is the approach here. Another approach to the opening though, or I'm sorry, another approach to checkmating the king is what I would call the end game technique. And in the end game technique, basically you're postponing the attack against the king. And instead the search, let's get off of here. Instead, the search is to create some kind of strong positional advantage. So this would be what's known as the King's Indian defense. And I'm planning to show some examples of this kind of opening. But for example, here, White's major objective is actually to start some kind of queen side play, usually involving c5, rook c1, knight b5, and then attacking on a7 and c7 or even d6, right? And so basically the end game technique tends to involve winning some amount of material at some point, at least a pawn, then generally promoting that pawn or forcing the opponent to give up a substantial amount of material in order to avoid pawn promotion. So the guy might have to sack a knight or the, the female, whoever's playing you, might have to sacrifice a knight or a rook for the pawn, which is getting ready to promote. And then you're going to use that excess material to checkmate the king, or perhaps you're successful at promoting a queen later in the game and then you use the extra queen to checkmate the king. But this is just very, very, very simple because I like to take abstractions out of the picture as much as possible. As chess players, most of us are aware of a lot of jargon. So we know what it means to be in Chetel the Bishop. We know what the Sicilian is, the King's Indian, the Benoni. We know all these words, but I wanna make it simpler than that. I want to imagine that the, that the rules of the game have just fallen out of your new set you're just now familiarizing yourself with how the pieces move and what the goal is. And then let's look at opening theory and strategy in relationship to that kind of idea. So I'm gonna back up here. So of course we could even say the simplest application of the opening method or the middle game method of trying to win would be the scholars mate, right? Right away. White is attempting to converge upon the F7 pawn and deliver checkmate. Okay, very simplistic view of, the, of how this could go. But basically I want to keep this in mind throughout what we're looking at, that ultimately the aim of both players is to assist themselves in one of these two methods. Now there's one other little thing I wanna throw in before we start looking at actual openings. And that is we've talked about there's two basic approaches of going for checkmate. Either you can go for it straight away in the middle game. You can create situations where you can start to attack the king right away, or you can look for it in the end game, looking for ways to gain some kind of material advantage and then to convert that later on in the game into checkmate. Both of these methods have one thing in common, which is that they both rely upon your ability to create threats. So whether you're threatening some pawn or some piece or to promote, or whether you're threatening to checkmate the king outright, eventually you have to create some kind of concrete threat in the position. This is also what combines strategy and tactics together. So if you're familiar with tactics, in tactics you're generally creating more than one threat at the same time, or you're creating some kind of unstoppable threat, and that would be a tactic. Strategy though also has a threat involved. Maybe it's long-term, but you're also trying to create a threat. Either way, and then we're gonna look at positions so this doesn't become too abstract. Either way, the whole situation involves you have to create a threat at some point in your position. So this is something else to keep in mind when we're studying the openings, is that eventually you have to create some kind of threat, either for material gain or for checkmate right away. So now let's start talking about the openings in general. So E4, or D4 are the most common ways of opening the game. And of course, these moves have real similarities, right? In each move, white is attempting to occupy the center with, or it's not attempting, he's immediately occupying the center with a pawn. And ideally, the ideal would be for white to achieve a pawn duo in the center. So why is controlling the center important? I know this might be very basic for some of you, but perhaps you'll enjoy this kind of like primer, a very basic opening strategy. 
why would I want to control the center if I'm handling the pieces? Well, if I'm handling either side, it turns out, of course, that most pieces benefit from being in contact with the center. As we've talked about before, ultimately, your goal is to create some kind of threat in the position. And most of the pieces have access to more squares when they have control of the center. So let's take the move E6. Many of you will be familiar, we call this the French defense. So in this position, Black is not occupying the center with a pawn just yet. Instead, he's looking to play the move pawn to d5. Okay. White continues with the move pawn to d4. Pawn to d5 is played. And then there are different ways for white to handle this position. One approach is e5, but the most popular would be knight c3 or knight d2, with knight d2 probably having a slightly stronger reputation here. And here we say that white has a space advantage. The space advantage here consists of the fact that white's pawn on e4 is slightly more advanced than black's pawn on e6. And as a result of this, white tends to have a better chance of kicking back black's pieces. For example, if black plays the move knight to f6, most common reply here will be e5, knight fd7. And already black has some congestion in the development of his pieces here. The knight on d7 is now slightly misplaced. It has some benefit being placed there, but right now it's confusing the development. The light squared bishop on c8 is also lacking some squares. And then this pawn on e5 may also serve as the basis for some sort of attack later on, especially if we're able to involve the f pawn in the attack. But here white has a slight space advantage and this space advantage will help white to accumulate further advantages in the placement of his pieces. For example, I'll be able to bring my bishop out to d3. Black has no such success in these positions. His bishop is restrained because the pawn on e5 is taking away this square on d6. So no opportunity for black to place his bishop on d6 here. Not really any strong options for this bishop at all. This bishop is probably going to end up on e7 where it's attacking nothing for some period of time. Whereas my bishop on d3 will be automatically eyeballing h7, which could be useful in attack. F pawn can roll forward. These are the benefits of white's position automatically. Again, many of you, depending on your level of play, will be totally familiar with these kinds of obvious points that I'm making, but you may not have stopped and just slowed it down a little bit and thought of it in terms of checkmating potential and the potential to create threats in the position, which is what I consider all openings to be about. Every single opening, every single strategy, every single tactic can ultimately be reduced to the point that we're playing for checkmate. And we need some kind of threat in order to make that happen. And so even when we're talking about advantages in time, advantages in space, advantages in material, they're still going to be subordinate to the fact that we're ultimately trying to create some kind of concrete threat. I feel it's so essential and often not discussed. Many times you'll be looking at somebody who's explaining something to you and they'll say, da, 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 this move goes here, this move goes here, da, 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 da. And perhaps you're left wondering, well, why? Why am I placing this piece here? Why am I putting that pawn there? But if you remember the very basic rules of the game, which is, I think, also important because most of us have very multifaceted life. So it might be easy to forget those kinds of simple points about chess. But when you come back to it, everything starts to make some sense. So how do we study the opening? Again, this is just a, a basic overview. Once we recognize the value of studying the openings and once we've got some of the basic framework open, how do we go about really getting into the nitty gritty of an opening? Well, m perhaps you're familiar with a very strong player, Timur Greyev, who's a very strong grandmaster, one of the best in the United States right now. Um, and I was having actually like a lunch with him many years ago, a friend of mine and happened to, we happened to have a lunch together at a big tournament. And he shared with me that he spent about three months on any given opening. And when he said that, I realized that this had worked for me in the past, but that I had accidentally stumbled upon this technique. So I have a friend of mine, national master Ignacio Perez, who also holds a FIDE master title. 
who I played a ton of games with before I became a national master. We just played blitz game after blitz game after blitz game after blitz game. And this guy is very, very skilled at playing the King's Indian opening, which was one of my sore points as white. So I open up with the move pawn to d4. This is my preferred way of opening up the game. And the King's Indian starts out with knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6. And then I play what's known as the classical variation, knight f3, castles, bishop e2. And we must have played hundreds upon hundreds of chess games in this position. And of course, being a studious and excited about the competition, I would go home afterwards and I would recreate as much as I could all of the games that we played from memory. I would just try to rattle them into chess base, everything that we played. And then I would sit there with engines and databases and try to explore and understand these positions. And over time, I found that I really penetrated a lot about chess strategy from studying the King's Indian in this way. And this went on for several months. And the King's Indian, in fact, became one of my best openings for me. Whereas before that, it was kind of an Achilles heel. It was an opening that I was not that successful at playing against with White. And so when Gureyev shared with me that what he would typically do is take a book. At that time, I had Sokolov's book on the Nimzo Indian, the E3 Nimzo Indian with me. And I said, Gureyev, how would you study this book? And he said, from 10 to one, Every morning I would take this book and I would just learn it, learn it, learn it, 10 to one for three months. So he said three hours a day, he would just delve into this book. Hopefully he doesn't mind me sharing this here. He probably isn't, doesn't even remember this conversation this is many years ago. But I said, aha, this guy's onto something because this actually has worked for me. I, with the King's Indian, I became very successful just as a result of every day applying myself to the same opening. And so just as a little incidental thing, when he shared this with me, I applied this approach to the semi-slav. And for those of you who are interested, if you search on YouTube, you'll find that I achieved two of my highest rated victories are in the semi-slav as white. And I actually have videos on each game. So I beat Ravachandran, yeah, right, a high rated international master Ravachandran. And I have that game online. And then I also have a very impressive victory against Grandmaster Ivanisevic one of the best players in the United States. He was a strong grandmaster at that time, rated over 2,700 USCF. And I actually managed to beat the guy. And I applied this technique. I just studied the semi-slav for hours every day and became very familiar with some of the nuances and then crushed some very strong opponents in that opening. And also recently, a couple of years, achieved a very strong victory. So this technique works. It's fun. It's intensive. I like the approach. It's, it's what every chess player dreams of. So in fact, today I brought a couple games in the King's Indian to use as an example. And so hopefully everybody's following. I'm, I'm gonna dare to check in. I, I actually don't see here the, the chat at all for, um, yeah, I don't see any chatting right now. So I'm just gonna keep, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't see any commentary. So I'm just gonna keep going with what I have here. So I brought a couple games of the King's Indian which we'll use both for entertainment and then we'll also use them as examples of, of how I view the opening. So this is the beginning of the classical variation of the King's Indian. And as I said before, what connects everything for me is that ultimately we're playing for a threat of some kind. There has to be some threat in the position. But at this point, White doesn't appear to have any kind of concrete threat, right? So far, nothing significant is happening for either side. Both sides are simply developing their pieces, okay? But White has what we call a space advantage. So there's a little book by Zanosko Borovsky, who was a very strong player in the early 1900s, called The Middle Game in Chess. And the way that he conceived of chess, he said chess is made of three individual components. So I'm gonna back up so I can delete these, delete all these arrows for now. Okay, so he said chess is made up of three major components. You have time, space, and material. And when he said that, he was speaking from a strictly scientific viewpoint. He wasn't thinking abstractly. He was saying there are 64 squares on the board, that space. Each player gets to make one move after the other. That's time. I make a move, you make a move. I make a move, you make a move. That's the time factor in chess. 
And then material, we have each of us begin the game with 16 units. So this would be the material component of chess. I'm just checking really quick because I know that the, all right. So we have time, we have space, we have material. And then he had different ways of looking at the space advantage. So the simplest way to conceive of a space advantage is who has their pawns advanced the furthest. So of course, in this position, white from that viewpoint has a substantial space advantage because the pawns are further advanced. Then as a consequence, the pieces have greater opportunities to develop. So for example, this bishop, white's bishop on C1 is presently the bishop that has is the minor piece with the most scope in this position. This bishop has free range along this diagonal here. We could also say that white's knight on C3 is benefiting from the fact that the pawns have already developed, have already been moved because black's knight on B8 is not able to reach the C6 squares easily. If he were to place knight C6 prematurely, then D5 would kick the knight back and the knight would not be well placed either on B8 or on A5, or if it came to E5, there would be a damage to the pawn structure. So at the moment, the knight on B8 is suffering a little bit as a result of white having these centralized pawns and black not being able to centralize the pawns. Okay, in this position, black seems to be doing more or less okay with his bishop here because the bishop on G7 occupies a long diagonal and the bishop on C8 also seems to have some open play. But for those of you who are familiar either with this position or who are familiar with chess, you may actually recognize that the bishops are not totally out of dodge here either. That in fact, it's not so easy for black to develop the light squared bishop because if it develops too early, it will probably be exchanged and then white will have the advantage of the bishop pair. And the dark squared bishop also encounters some problems. So what I have found from studying a lot of openings very deeply is that this is very common in chess openings is that first of all, white's advantage appears to be the centralized positions of the pawns, but then it creates a kind of domino effect. So I start out with better pawns, but almost always this leads also to better minor pieces if I'm handling the white pieces. And this is typically what white's advantage consists of in the majority of openings, especially ones where white is not playing for an all out attack early on. So generally it starts with a small advantage in the pawn structure, and then it turns into a small advantage in the minor pieces then what are we gonna do with this? Ultimately, we're gonna use this advantage of our pawns and our pieces to try to create some kind of threat in the position that the opponent can't handle. The opponent will first of all, experience some kind of congestion in trying to defend against the threat. And secondly, the opponent won't be as successful at creating counter threats because he'll have some difficulty with the coordination of his forces. And what I've just told you there applies to so many openings that is quite incredible. So sticking with our basic analogy here of the King's Indian defense, I played Bishop E2, Black played E5. For the purposes of this video, I'll skip the move C5 here. C5 is very interesting, but is usually not played in the King's Indian for some reasons, which I'll, I'll just leave alone for today. Castles, Knight C6, D5, Knight E7. Again, as I said before, Black's minor pieces are suffering a little bit here. At this point, it's no longer abstract. This bishop on g7 is still blocked in. In theory, we would call this a bad bishop on g7 because the dark squared pawns are limiting the scope of the dark squared bishop. This can change if somehow the e pawn is exchanged on f4, or if the e pawn is able to move forward to e4, then this bishop may suddenly become liberated it may also become possible at some point that this bishop can come to h6 and then exchange itself for something. But for the time being, this bishop is what we would classify as a bad bishop. Likewise, the bishop on c8, even though it's open, is unlikely to find any real positive play here. If it comes to g4 in this position, I would be very happy to exchange it for my own light squared bishop. And then black will find that he's missing a very key piece in this position without that light squared bishop he'll have some difficulty with his plans down the road, uh, which is something that we will maybe discuss later on in this game. Anyhow, 
I played knight e1, which is my preferred move here. There are other options such as knight d2 or pawn to b4. I played the move knight to e1 here. Presumably I'm going for knight d3, but I'm also preparing to play this move f3 as a way of solidifying the center. So knight e1, the game which I'm now going into, I played against a fellow national master, David Bragg. Uh, this game was played in 2011. So it's possible that I was not quite a national master yet at this time. He played knight d7, liberating the f pawn. Pretty much one of the only moves here. The other move is knight e8, which I actually think is quite a bit worse here, but which is still quite popular for people. So knight d7, I played, in fact, I played bishop e3 first. F5, F3. These are some markings that I made. So I'm playing F3 in this position, just solidifying the center. Black continued F4, Bishop F2, G5. So I also I have a video on the King's Indian opening in, on our YouTube channel. And in that video, I explained that one of the very precarious things about the King's Indian is that despite all of these different development issues which Black is facing here, it just so happens that he finds his positioning to be appropriate for launching a King's side attack. So Black is actually going to be using what we would call the middle game technique. He's very interested in trying to deploy the pawns further and then to create some kind of direct attack, perhaps sometimes with rook f6 to g6 or h6. And then there are also some different kinds of plans here, but they're all held together by this idea of attacking the king. To me, it's kind of a wild card thing. It's very strange to me, the king's Indian, because the whole opening almost looks as if black is going to be attacking the queen side because he starts with the fianchetto of this bishop on g7. But in fact, this ends up being totally incidental it's actually seems to be the case that black fianchettos the bishop, closes the center, and then starts an attack on the king's side. In reality, this is okay for black, but it, there's no real understanding as to why this occurs. It just so happens this is how the pieces are constellated in this position. So this is black's plan. On the other hand, white is going to be looking for an attack on the queen side. So f3, f4, bishop f2, g5. I now play the move, rook to c1. And I'm planning to play the move pawn to c5, and then I'll be able to create some threats, our big word for the day, right? By the way, I also want to explain, well, let's just hold off on that. So rook c1, knight g6, c5. This is now a well-known variation, pawn to c5. This is offering a temporary pawn sacrifice as a way of opening up the pieces on the queen side. So if black captures, which is the main line, b4, and now if the knight were to retreat to d7, this is regarded as a mistake because after knight b5, there's no good way to hold the c7 pawn. And then black is actually at risk for further material loss. For example, if knight takes c7 is achieved and then bishop takes a7, Black may also lose the exchange. It's also possible for the knight to go from c7 to e6. And then even if the light squared bishop is exchanged, that would still be a very advantageous position for white here. So we have knight b5, possible there. So the main move after b4, in fact, is the move knight to a6. And then white can either play knight d3 or knight to b5. And over time, there will be counter threats against a7, c7. And this position, in my opinion, leads to an initiative for white. However, after c5, my opponent played the move knight to f6. For those of you who are very interested in opening theory, this actually transposes into what tends to happen if black played knight e8 earlier. I regard this as a mistake in this position. Again, just for the purposes of today's video, I won't go into this in too much detail. In fact, I've gone into some detail on one of our apps here. So we actually have some detail from our, that I've done on this position, but for today, let's just leave it at this. Knight f6 is played. I take on d6, he recaptures, knight b5. The same problems are facing black in this position. The knight is threatening, the big word for today, 
to come into c7. He's also threatening to capture on a7. And this is the point I do want to discuss at some point that this light squared bishop, despite having no real way to activate itself, still plays a big role in Black's attack because it's helping to support the move g4. And in some cases, if white plays the move h3 as a way of slowing down Black's counterattack on the king side, this bishop can actually be sacrificed on h3. So if Black loses this bishop or exchanges this bishop on c8, he tends to have lost a major player in his attack on the king side, and this will benefit white substantially because this will mean that white can go ahead with his queen side assault without much worry about the king side assault being successful. Rook f7 was played here. And now, interestingly, there's a little nuance here which white needs to be familiar with. I've seen some games where white has without preparation played the move knight takes a7, which is not a terrible move, but there is a there is a subtlety here which is very strong for white. The key is to play queen c2, and I was aware of this during the game. So I played queen c2. This threatens right away to bring the knight into the c7 square once again. And now black, as you'll see here from Stockfish, his best move is to play knight e8 in this position, but now he slowed down substantially from playing g4 because the knight has been forced to retreat. And now's the time to play knight takes a7, bishop d7. Then the queen goes to b3. Very nice subtlety because the queen stepped on c2 as a way to bring the knight back to e8 and then jumps to b3. Let's maybe slow it down so I'm not going too fast here. And let's review. So again, today we're talking about the openings. And I've now gone into the King's Indian as just an example. So I laid out some framework about how I view the opening and how I study the opening. And then this, of course, would be one of the examples of what I call now the three month technique, which is Gurev's idea of spending three months on an opening. So as I said before, everything you're seeing here is the result of a substantial effort on my part in the King's Indian before I actually had formalized this three month technique as a technique. That was only after I had a conversation with Graev that I understood that this is actually a powerful way to study any individual opening. But for this case, actually, this was just the result of my blitz matches with Ignazio. I became very familiar with the theory of the King's Indian opening. And now we see a position where white has a substantial space advantage. This is because of the central pawns. And by the way, there are other way of looking at the space advantage we're not gonna go into detail on it right now, but there are other ways of looking at white space advantage because once again, space is really about how many squares are under attack. And you have to always think in terms of checkmating the king. So just because a player has a space advantage does not mean that the position is, is winning by any means because if there's a simple checkmate in one, doesn't matter how much space or material or time you're up, checkmate ends the game. And this is actually Black's argument in the King's Indian, that white actually may tend to get a material advantage, a space advantage, and yet if he succumbs to an attack on the king side, it will be of no use. So white always has to be on guard in these positions for this possibility that black may succeed at his attack despite total strategic collapse. So I don't believe that David Bragg, a national master, was very familiar with this position. Um, first of all, evidenced by the fact that he played knight f6, and then also this move he now plays b6, and I was left now to my own resources. And according to Stockfish here, it looks like my solution was not adequate here. I played queen c6, simply attacking both a8 and d6. I don't, I don't have analysis here as to why knight d3 might be better. My, my guess, just looking at it right now, my guess is that this knight perhaps is headed towards c6. Of course, you may also be aware that you wanna be careful with trusting quick computer analysis in these kinds of positions, um, which is something I'm also familiar with in the King's Indian because the computer is actually quite good at underestimating Black's attacks in these positions. It, it, can, it can be playing too slow here. And there were many times that I would play blitz games with Ignazio, analyze his attacks and suddenly the computer evaluation would change in certain positions because Black's attack may be down the road. It may be difficult for Black for the computer to detect without a lot of depth or without actually seeing the positions on the board. So I don't know if I trust this idea that I should be playing knight d3 and maneuvering knights and stuff like that. 
anyhow, who knows? It'd be something interesting to look at. In the game, I simply played the move queen to c6. See, already it's jumping up a little bit. Bishop a6 was the reply. I had a little think here. So now we're, of course, decidedly away from theory. And I myself played knight takes d6 here. All right. From here, this may be of limited value for our for the rest of our session. And I, I see here this the computer disagrees with my with my my play here. Bishop takes e2 was played. And knight takes f7. All right, you guys, I'm intrigued just to see what 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 is the disagreement the computer is having with me here. King takes f7. and then bishop c5. Preparing to play rook f2 and threatening queen e6 mate in this position. All right, looks like this game is not is not really the best for, for our analysis going forward because it does look like I mishandled the position here. Uh, Stockfish is adamant about, about better chances here, which I was not aware of. So this is, this is slightly humorous here, but let's, Let's, in fact, I have another game here on the King's Indian, which I know for a fact I played with more uh, precision. So this is against uh, who I believe is now a women's international master. Her name is Alexandra Botez. She plays often in the States, in Washington. I believe she's, she resides in Vancouver, Canada, which is not far away from, from Seattle, where I live. So again, we have the, the King's Indian here. I'm, I don't know how to erase stuff, but perhaps we can stop here and discuss other ways of talking about a space advantage. So in some of the situations in his book, The Middle Game in Chess, Zanosko Borowski actually went so far as to count all the squares that each side has under attack. So he would literally count, okay, white is attacking the e5 square, the d5 square, the c5 square, the b5 square with the pawn and with the knight. The c4 square is under attack. The d4 square, the e4 square, the f4 square, the g3, h3, f3, he would go on like this. And this creates some kind of interesting results because at the end of it, you're going to be able to understand who has access to more squares. And then you can actually stop and ask why. So as we've already discussed, white will probably have some extra squares because of the advancement of his pawns and because his bishops and knights are a little bit further advanced than the opponents. This is probably gonna be the result Another way that Sonos Gabrowski would do the same method, he would actually just create kind of a square of the centralized 16 squares. And then he would count how many of those squares each side had under, had under attack. And this exercise has again produced very interesting results when I've done it. It tends to work. You always find, okay, whoever has the more central squares tends to have the better pieces. And this is another way of looking at the space advantage. So we could do this here. This is pretty straightforward in this position. So white's attacking f5, that's one, e5, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 for white. And then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 for black. All right, it's a one square difference, but as the game wears along, you can repeatedly check this and you'll find that it's actually probably going to increase. For example, after knight c6, which is played in the game, and then d5, knight e7, because of the move d5, white now has two more of these centralized squares under attack, c6 and e6. And I don't feel that black has gained any, any additional squares as a result of this knight maneuver. So white would now probably have an even more substantial number of squares under his attack. And again, there is some truth behind this technique because most of the pieces benefit from being centralized. As a result of being centralized, they're attacking more squares typically in both directions. And by the way, there actually are lines in this position of the King's Indian where white actually can attack the king side. It's actually a possibility, usually involving king h1 and g4 at a certain moment. So the space advantage is giving white quite a bit of flexibility. I mean, again, his ability to start an attack on a7 and c7 is a direct consequence of the advancement of his pawns, the advancement of his pieces. So to me, this is, Basically, as I said before, I learned a lot about chess strategy as a result of delving into these kinds of positions because I was totally oblivious 
to some of the ideas involved in the space advantage. Later on, I also found that in some lines of the Bogo Indian, if anybody's interested, you'll also find some similar plans for white, but ultimately all of the plans are held together by the idea of a threat, by the idea of the pieces becoming more coordinated and having access to threats. This is what holds a lot of opening theory together in my opinion. So knight e1 was played in this game. Now, Alexandra plays the move knight e8, which I have already said, I believe it is a slight inaccuracy, but in general, it will transpose to what happened in the game with David Bragg, which by the way, I won that game, despite apparently not playing that, that um, position after b6 so well. So f3, f4, bishop f2, g5. All right, in this position, because she has not placed the knight on d7, I can play c5 immediately without the preparatory move rook c1. So I did so. Knight g6, a4. This is this is a typical move in this position. So this pawn is going to come to the a5 square. Um, as you may have seen in some of the positions I described earlier, the b6 square will become useful for white either to position a queen or a bishop later on, or sometimes even a knight. So the a4 pawn is already marching the way up the board as a way of beginning this idea. She now captured on c5, bishop takes c5. What Ignacio used to say when he would play these positions, he'd say, Kelly, most players don't have any feeling for the chess positions. They don't understand. And you cannot hesitate when you're playing the King's Indian, you cannot hesitate to play your attack. So he, he made me very aware and he was very insistent. And as I said, he was very skilled at these positions. I mean, coming up with undreamt of stuff in these positions for black. And so what he, what he convinced me of is that whenever the opponent is doing this kind of stuff, moving knights back to e8 and then taking on c5, he really was certain that by now black is probably screwed or, or sorry to use that language for kids, you know, but it's like, it's like he was really convinced that she just cannot do this kind of stuff. And I could hear his voice in my head during these kinds of positions and it helped me to feel more aggressive. So she now plays knight d6. This knight is going on a wild adventure far away from the square g4, which is an important part of Black's attack. So white is going to continue. What are we looking for here? We're looking for threats. Ultimately, white is looking for some way to create some kind of threat in the position. And I like to use the word converge because in most cases you need more than one piece cooperating in a threat because you need your pieces to converge upon a certain point you need the cooperation of multiple forces. And what better way to have your pieces cooperate than to have a space advantage? Because when you have a space advantage, I know I'm repeating myself, when you have a space advantage, your pieces can reach more squares. They have more squares under threat. They can move more easily. And you just happen to find that your pieces can start to converge upon points. You can have threats, and then you can start to look for a handy dandy middle game technique or end game technique and then you can look for a way to checkmate the opponent. So a5 was played, a6, knight d3. Even I'm not sure at this point what I was thinking at this point, but h5, poor Alexandra is far away from being able to achieve the, the g4 advance because of this knight, which is running around on d6, not doing a whole lot of anything. So, so I'm taking my own sweet time, b4. As I'm looking at this, this game was played uh, 10 years ago, and I, I think that I would have probably thought my way to a more decisive way of playing this than, than the way I'm playing right now, because what I'm doing here also looks a little bit slow. So Alexandra is now coming out with rook f6, presumably to reposition this rook on g6, where it can help to, to play the move g4. I played rook c1, so by now she goes bishop d7, the bishop retreats, Bishop F2. Something else I'd like to communicate. This is also a little bit of what Ignacio was saying, is that in my opinion, there's a sort of inevitability to White's attack on the queen side. If if Black is not making the king side attack happen, it's just a matter of time before White White penetrates and breaks through here because there's just too much force starting to go in this direction. You've got one, two, three, four, five pieces. The queen can jump into B3 at any time. The bishop on E2 can be useful. So bishop f2, queen e8. She's still moving at a, at a sm snail's pace here. I just played bishop f2. Why is it not allowing queen e8? All right, queen e8. 
my C5. As I said before, I think this by this year, I might handle this slightly differently. But what am I doing? I'm getting ready to eliminate the bishop on d7. The knight recaptured. I now played knight a4. This knight is headed towards e6. And right now I'm threatening c7. So at this point, the threat is becoming evident. Now it's very clear to me. This e6 square, the c7 pawn, the b7 pawn is also weak. And in this position, the main the main symptom of that weakness is that the knight is going to be forced to stay on d6 far away from the attack on the king's side. So black has very little counter chances. You can see that Stockfish is very excited about white's prospects in this position. So knight a4 was played. Rook c8, knight c5. The knight is headed towards e6. Good luck preventing this. And you'll have some difficulty if there's an exchange on, on c5. So let's say that knight takes c5 is played. Isn't this nice that Stockfish has, has abandoned us here? Because I'm interested to see what it would think here. Um, but my guess is that c takes, the knight is going to retreat. And then, you know, I can take my own sweet time. There's no hurry because c6 is of interest here, followed by bishop takes a6 and then bishop b7. But who wants to lose the pawn on? a5. I would just like to play queen b3 here or something like this. Targeting b7, eventually breaking through with d6 or c6, or maybe playing rook b1 and then at the right moment hitting c6 with a pin, and then perhaps bishop takes a6 or bishop a7 can also swoop in. So I said that really fast. I hope that some players can catch what I'm saying, but you know, let's say rook b8. I would probably play rook b1. Stockfish is coming to join us, but I don't want it to rain on my parade now because now I found a plan. I want to play c6. And then I want the bishop to jump into a7 and then for my queen to jump into b7 or after c6, I can take on a6. I would consider this to be quite sufficient. And you can see that now we're, we're up to a rook advantage according to the machine. Nothing has happened yet. This is the beauty of these positions. This is what I was starting to discover as I would go deep into these positions. It's like white is... White is up no material in, in theory. I mean, you could say the bishop pair counts as a little thing, but look, Stockfish is already saying we're up a rook. So anybody who's interested could set up this position with Stockfish and then go into the variations. And of course, if Stockfish. it's saying we're up a rook, and then go into that the must mean that within a short time, white actually is going to win substantial material in this position. And for beginning players, this may not be totally evident. So this would be a very fun position to play around with the machine. You could play a little game here. You could you could try to defend these positions of black against the computer, and then you would probably become aware of all the different difficulties that black is going to face here. And this could be very instructive. So white, without having done much, apparently, just kind of moving some pieces around, has gotten quite far. So rook c8, knight c5. Alexandra is far away from, from what we'll call Ignacio's imperative. Her attack has not gone anywhere. So she plays knight f8. I play queen b3. Like I said, this is... Now, now even I can say there's no hurry. We're not in any hurry here. What's the rush? Queen b3, king h8. Let's double rooks while we're at it. Rook c3, queen g6. Trying to get that little push in. h3 without a bishop on c8. There's no cigar. If the bishop was on c8, as I've shared earlier, it's just a motif to be aware of in the King's Indian, then bishop takes h3 followed by g4 would actually be something that white would have to be nervous about. And certainly in this kind of position, black should do it almost without thinking because the position is becoming perilous on the queen side. So there'd be no reason not to go into this if, if you were handling the black pieces. But the exchange of the light squared bishop is, is detrimental. This was also a contribution by Ignacio. He insisted that the exchange of the queens or the loss of the exchange or loss of the bishop on c8 was a nightmare for black. He just insisted you cannot get rid of these pieces in the king's Indian. So I was very lucky to have to have this mentor while I was on my way to national master who could explain some of this to me. So I'm just going to double up my rooks and and then uh, I played then queen c2, bishop f6. And then finally, I did what Nimzovich calls revolutionary means. Now, who needs a gradual approach? I just sacked on b7. Uh, it looked like Stockfish was agreeing with me. So I've gotten 
I've gotten two pawns, right? And then the c7 pawn is bound to fall. Bishop takes b7, bishop takes a6, sorry, rook b8. I took here, she took a6, my pawn is running, rook b8, a7, rook c8, rook a8, sorry. And then I've gotten the third pawn and I've got connected passers. And I, it looks like I judged this position properly. Look, the machine is saying 7.8. Of course, what's the threat? It's to bring this B pawn up the board and finish off the game that way. Also, rook c8 is a threat here too, because once the rook is usurped from the a8 square, that's gonna be the end. But I wanna be careful not to allow rook, rook e takes a7. So g4, finally, she's getting a little attack going but it's too little too late. F takes g4, h takes g4, h takes g4. Don't want to allow that pawn to make it to g3. Queen takes g4. I played queen d3. I liked that move because the queen could either, well, you'll, we'll see in a moment that there's some other ideas for the queen, but if the queen is able even to go to h3 and exchange, and also this is preventing f3, which is important. If the queen is able to trade on h3, that's also probably going to be a nightmare for, for black. Rook g7 was played. I captured. Captures. I played queen a3. Again, preventing an exchange sacrifice. Bishop d8. Oh, no, this is... Ah, I played rook c8 here. Rook c8. Looks illogical at the beginning, because what am I going to do? Sack the pawn? No, no, no. If rook takes c8, I'll play queen h3 check. And then my queen will suddenly appear from a3 to c8 in a short period of time. And the a7 pawn will be assisted in its promotion. And that will lead to further material loss. And then what will happen? Black will get checkmated. So rook c8, I like that move. All right. I may have overlooked something when I did this fancy move. Yeah, bishop h4 is indicated by the machine. Very strange. Okay, this is trying to create some difficulty on f2 for me. So, so there actually is some, some trick here, which was missed by both sides. It turns out there was a way for me to get out of this situation. I just take the bishop, because if I take here, takes, takes. Now, I don't want to bore you too much with this details, because this is getting off from our thing. It looks like it was inappropriately fancy for me to play like this, because now I would lose the pawn with check. This would be a disaster. But if I sense the difficulty in time and just take the bishop and push the pawn, it'll be enough. So rook c8 was overly fancy, not necessary at all. But she she did not take. She played queen b7. I captured. She captured. b5 was played. I'm also attacking the f8 knight here. King g8. And resignation happened after queen d6. There's no stopping queen c6 here, and there'll be substantial material loss. So it almost looked like a picturesque game, except for the fact that rook c8 was a little bit too fancy and could have messed up the attack for some time. But you know what? We're nearing the end. This is perfect timing. We've got like one minute left here. And I think I laid some groundwork here for some ideas in the opening, how I approached the opening, the three-month technique. I talked about Zanos Gabrowski's book. I gave a little bit of insight into the King's Indian, which I think is a great example of the space advantage. Showed a couple little vignettes of some games and you got to see this variation. So I'm pretty pleased with today's show. Of course, I'm not looking at my, my image. So hopefully everybody was able to see everything okay. And I hope that I didn't overlook any truly significant comments. Um, you can find on my YouTube channel, you can find a link to my page, chessopenings.com. And I have a contact information there. So feel free to write me if you had any questions about today. If you're interested in private sessions, if you just want to say hello, I love receiving emails from people. Uh, according to me, I have 26 seconds, but I feel satisfied with today. And I hope that you are too. And I hope we do this again. Thanks for watching.